and at uh, Modern Medicine 1990, shows renowned for the rise to prominence of the young British artists. Um, Matt was just reminded me earlier that actually there's quite a lot of photography in his own practice, but today's talk is going to focus on the recent collaboration Thresholds, which I think a few have already seen, but a VR staging of one of the earliest photography exhibitions from 1839. Matt Kotshaw. Thanks. I've got some uh, images here, and I'm just going to run them. They're not going to be relating to what I'm saying particularly, but it's all part of the project, so I'm just going to leave all that running and now try to explain to you about what it was that I tried to do and then what it was that I finished up doing in the end. Um, this is a pamphlet um, published by the... British Association for the Advancement of Science and it was an exhibition of cutting-edge technology in 1839. It was an exhibition that was a precursor of the great exhibition of 1851, basically a way in which people could show off what it is that they'd been working on. In this case quite specifically it was apparatus and equipment that had some technological application. Within all of these optical instruments and steam engines and various other instruments and implements were 93 photographs by William Henry Fox Talbot and it was the first time these photographs have been shown to the public in the form of an exhibition. I work in imagery generally a lot of the time it's photography, sometimes it's video or um, lenticular prints. I also work in painting, and sculpture, video projection, optical illusions, three-dimensional zoetropes. But what interests me is the way that we look at the world through images and the way that we try to construct this simulation of the world, which sometimes we kind of prefer looking at rather than looking at the real world. So it became like evident to me that at some point or other I'd have to try and find something, a subject matter that I could use in virtual reality. It's a medium that's been around for about 30 years and it is by far the most effective means for a total immersion inside imagery. Generally what I'm doing when I'm... Um, creating a work is that I, I've got like two two uh, categories I have a list of um, subject matter that I'd like to deal with and then I have another list of kind of materials and techniques of way of making things and generally I'm looking for a way of putting those two things together where I can get the technique and the form the way the thing is made to say something about the subject matter that I'm dealing with and with virtual reality I was struggling and it was on the back burner I couldn't really come up with anything and I was seeing quite a few VR experiences around but I didn't really want to make something that had to do with magic forests and unicorns and little leprechauns and I didn't want to do something that was using like VR camera setup where you're filming the real world and trying to get people immersed in the real world I wanted something that was between those two points and I wanted something that kind of reflected on the status of VR what it was and, and, and where it was at in, in this the history of image making um, and I made an exhibition with Pete James a photo historian at Birmingham Library a couple of years ago I went into their archives there and he alerted me to this box of police crime scene photographs which I later went on to make the exhibition for but I kind of lived up there for a week or so and ate dinner with him every night and one night we were talking about this first ever exhibition of photography which Talbot did in 39 and he was saying that it happened in this building which was kind of opposite where we were having a curry and it was really quite extraordinary that I didn't really know about it I'd not read about it and it seemed to me that not a lot of other people knew very much about it and it, it had happened in this building opposite 
where we were eating. And he had talked about trying to recreate this exhibition in the real world, but there are obvious problems to this because a lot of the photographs from 1839 are very light sensitive. They're not been fixed properly, so most of them are locked away in light proof vaults. You can't really get them out. A lot of them are too faded to actually see. And on top of that, you'd have to recreate the building in which the exhibition took place, which is quite impossible because it's huge and it's been demolished about 100 years ago. Um, and I started thinking, well, maybe this could be a good subject matter for a virtual reality project because 1839, it's the birth of photography. It's this moment when everything changes in terms of image making. Suddenly you have this technology that can produce images independent of the artist's hand. So it's like a threshold moment when suddenly we have the, the ability to make images and to reproduce images in a way that we never had before. And with virtual reality, the way that it's just happening over the last couple of years, the prices are coming down, the technology, technology is getting a lot, um, a lot, lot smaller, the accessibility is going up, a lot of people are buying them when they buy their phones or when they get um, playstations. So suddenly they're becoming a realistic medium for, for, for people to work with and they're becoming part of the currency and the, the way that we look at the world. Um, so it's like a threshold moment again there that we're suddenly now dealing with this medium that can give you 100% immersion in the subject matter. So I thought if we use this latest image-based technology to go back to the birth of photography, the first real image-based technology, then people walking into that exhibition in 1839 possibly won't be wowed by looking at a slightly muddy print of Lake Hock Abbey, but they might be wowed by this new technology. So they're going through a similar kind of experience as the people in 170 years ago were. So I then started to do a lot of research with Pete about what was in this original exhibition and where it was and what the room looked like. And I um, got a chap called David Blissett on board, who's an architectural historian, to try and give us some advice as to how the room that we were recreating actually looked. It's a building by Charles Barry and Pugin, so it's the same architects who built the House of Parliament. Very significant building because it was it's kind of their warm-up act before they went on to design the House of Parliament. And he was able to advise on certain things such as the kind of wood that they would have used and the stain on the wood and the varnishes on the wood and the kind of stone, the furniture. And we went to the King Edward School in Birmingham which kept a lot of the plans and diagrams of the original building that Charles Barry had made. The, the, the building was a school, King Edward School, until about 1930 when it was demolished and then the school moved to another part of Birmingham where all the records are kept. So we got access to these records, we've got quite accurate plans and with David Blissett's advice we managed to put together quite a good idea of how this room would actually look. And then Pete James recruited Greg Hobson from Bradford Media Museum and Larry Scharf, who's like a kind of world-renowned expert on on Talbot and Brian Liddy, who's now at the Bodleian Library, another expert on Talbot, and they started to try and piece together the 93 photographs that Talbot put in the exhibition. We had a list which came up earlier, which basically gives you a category and then a description of the photograph that Talbot had exhibited not easy to actually locate these images and then when we located them we have to ask permission because they're spread all in collections all over the world then we've got to get scans for them and then we've got to import them into our model and dealing with four different photo historians there's a lot of disagreement over which particular dandelion that fox talbot had exhibited in 1839 because he was highly prolific and he made tens of thousands of images so at the same time, I am designing the the room, my actual room, which is a simulation of the 
the, the building at King Edward School with some guys who work in CGI and with a group of fabricators I work with who build things in the real world and we're trying to basically create a CAD drawing which is possible to build in the real world but it's also a good simulation of our building from 1839 which the guys in CGI are, are recreating. Hey, good. Are you on? Can I just mute this? Thanks. One of the problems was that I wanted to have an exhibition that was fairly compact so it could be put on a trip, put on a trip, uh, reinstalled and, and have an exhibition for a while. So we had to be quite limited in the space and I settled on a room of about eight and a half metres by six metres by about two and a half metres wide. This gave me a problem that the original room was absolutely huge. It's like kind of 30 feet long, 30 feet high. So how was I going to have to have these two different rooms to simulate the room and the children? So I found them building two banks of the children in the room of my virtual room. Either end of my actual room. So that in the real world, when you come to the end of the room, see in the, in, the, in the top there, you are confronted by a vitrine which stops you going further down because it's the end of the room in the real world. And then in the virtual room, because it's a glass vitrine, you can see through the glass right down to the end of the room. So you get this illusion of a space going left and right and up, although you're in quite a limited space yourself. So it became apparent to me from very early on that I didn't just want to have this uh, VR exhibition where you get somebody with a headset on sitting on a swivel chair where you enter a gallery and then you've got to wait for some guy who's on there for 15 minutes you're looking at your watch and then you've got to see this guy on a swivel chair and then you get your headset on and cue in, in that kind of manner which is generally the way I've seen most VR experiences in art exhibitions I wanted something that did a little bit more than that and took the VR experience to another level and the most effective experiences I've had are not when I've seen these fantastic space travel experiences it's just there's, there's uh, some little experiences that Samsung created for the Samsung Gear VR headset where basically you go into a cinema and then you can watch I know, a Tom Cruise movie or I like guess Pixar animated film but you're sitting in a cinema and it could be a cinema on the moon or it could be a cinema that's in the grass with lots of mushrooms over the top of you or you could just be in a regular kind of auditorium like we're in today and the most interesting thing was of course not the VR that's going on here it's just like this seat that appears so real next to you and it's just absolutely there and it's just mundane and it's something you know from the real world but it's, it's, it's not there but it is there but of course when you try and touch it the whole thing dissolved because physically it's not there so I thought if I try to build a real world equivalent to everything that I have inside my virtual CGI world people might be able to walk around touch things and their, um, their, 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 their senses will be stimulated by this haptic element as well as being kind of stimulated by the optical element so I set about trying to um, create a movement detection system with some sensors that would um, be calibrated so that when you actually moved around the space you would be touching the things in the real room that were synchronized with the, the uh, objects in the virtual room. To do this I cold called a lot of university departments, people working in computer science, unfortunately got hold of um, Paul Tennant at the Mixed Media Lab at Nottingham University and he was looking for a project anyway that had that worked in this kind of area so he was up for studying it basically working on it developing it with me and then it was a project that he would study and then publish his findings about Nottingham University then gave us a bit of money to pay for his work and then to pay for a little bit of uh, like subsistence travel etc 
So with Paul, I started developing this movement detection system and a means of actually traveling around the room without being tethered to a computer, which is like quite annoying and it's, it interferes with your, your freedom and it interferes with the, this sense that you actually are in this virtual room that I've recreated. Um, so we just started very simply by having a VR headset with a box with a ball inside the box and CGI and then built a box in the real world the same as that and matched it all up and it still seemed to work. Over a period of about a year we developed that from the very simple box haptic CGI experience to the um, <coughs> thresholds project which you have here. All of the um, materials that I used inside the actual room here we tried to make as similar as possible to the um, the, the materials in the uh, VR simulation so the wood on the side of the vitrines is made of wood so it's kind of warm to the touch it has a texture to it whereas the glass on the vitrines is made from um, an aluminium substrate called alu panel which is basically like a dye bond aluminium with a matte white coating on it so that when you tap it it has a very hard and cold and smooth feel in contrast to the wood the windows also have the same aloe panel and then the paintings have that aloe panel on them as well there's a few other little elements other than this haptic element that you can experience as you're going around the fire there has got a little heater in the real world very real basic lo-fi but extremely convincing when you're standing in front of that roaring fire and you can actually feel the heat for up to, up to a couple of meters away from you. It's very strange. We had a lot of response people coming out of the room saying, yeah, I get all the kind of the touch stuff, I can even see all that, but how do you get the heat? How does that work? Is that about my brain making you think that it's hot because there's a fire there kind of thing? It's like, well, it's just like a heater. It's the most obvious thing, but people just kind of confused because of this century... Um, manipulation that's going on. Another element that I decided to introduce pretty early on, which to me really made the project worth doing, what came about from other research that we were doing into the <coughs> exhibition and what was happening at the time. Sorry, I forgot, I neglected to say that this exhibition happened in, in Birmingham, um, which was at the time centre of the Industrial Revolution, a city of a thousand trades. It's just a great place for um, scientific developments to take place because they, they, uh, you had so many manufacturers of different products it was a good place to actually make a prototype. Anyway at that time in Birmingham were the um, Chartist riots that were in all the big industrial towns in England uh, particularly in Birmingham the Bull Ring riots were in July of 1839 very very violent lots of people um, arrested, sentenced to hang, windows were smashed, uh, banks and shops were burnt down, lots of violence. And the reverberations of the process were still going on into August, which is when this exhibition took place. And we found letters uh, from Talbot to his friend, the astronomer John Herschel, saying that he was really concerned about mounting this exhibition because obviously there's a lot of money going into it, there's a lot of preparation and uh, a lot of the equipment's quite sensitive and he was concerned that the Chartists may uh, take exception to this exhibition and want to smash it up in the way that they've been doing to other shops and, and buildings. And he had certain reservations about mounting the exhibition because of this. The Chartists were demonstrating because they wanted representation in Parliament, they wanted the vote, but they're also slightly suspicious about certain technological innovations which were happening, which were potentially taking their jobs away from them. It's the kind of the middle of the industrial revolution, factory automation is taking away a lot of jobs. And people are suspicious generally about what is happening in these science labs where these machines are being created that can do the job that a man can do. So when I heard about these things that were going on, it resonated with a lot of the reading that I've been doing about advances in digital technology and how robots and uh, computers and algorithms 
are slowly eroding a lot of the jobs that people have assumed are going to be around for a long time. So we don't really know where that's going, but it seems certain that um, a lot of automated jobs, a lot of routine jobs are going to be taken away by robots and computings. So I wanted this spectre of the social implications and the repercussions of technological advances to be hanging around this project, which was, in a sense, a, um, a celebration of the... Um, joys of digital technology that you can put this headset on you can walk around and you can have this wonderful fabulous experience that there's a downside to all these innovations and that there are social repercussions um, there's a few other things we added to the um, the CGI room basically the, the build that we had is essentially a 3D model which we then import, import into uh, an engine Called, in this case Unity and Unity turns the CGI model into something that you can actually navigate in the VR world. You can then add several things in Unity which is what we did such as certain lighting effects and certain little live action effects such as we have moths uh, around the gasoliers and we have little mice running up and down the room on the floor and we have um, some spiders crawling around too there's one painting in the exhibition which in the real world is an actual window with glass in it and so that people when they're queuing to get inside the experience can watch people moving around with a headset on like little insects kind of trying to feel the surfaces there and navigate this world as though they were kind of strange blind creatures so you can see all this going on from outside but somebody inside the room is looking at that painting, looking at you, looking at them with a 3D headset on. So they're looking at painting that's going back a couple of hundred years, or you're looking at them, looking at this VR simulation. So these different levels of reality all happening within the space of about half a meter. The spider I put on that particular painting just so I could hold people's gaze a little bit longer. It was only so long that you're going to want to look at a painting of Edward the Sixth. So the spider just keeps people looking at that, at that piece of glass a little bit longer. Um, when people are outside looking in, it, it, that thing about waiting for your turn in an exhibition before you can put the headset on yourself, and it's really kind of dull and boring. So I wanted to create this environment where it was actually quite engaging to see these people in these VR headsets. So the finished exhibition room in the real world is loosely based on Kubrick's 2001 Space Odyssey, the final scenes, which in the Arthur C. Clarke book is when um, our spaceman travels to this distant universe and he's welcomed by these, this alien life form and they construct this Victorian, simulated Victorian room for him to, to feel at home. In Kubrick's version he, he did use like Georgian uh, architecture but it was this kind of white, clean, slightly modish um, reference to architectural um, rooms from the past that, that I wanted to use. So it was like Odyssey Clock simulated room that Kubrick used, which I then used. So that when you look at these people wandering around, they look kind of almost like spacemen themselves with their backpacks and their headsets on so it, it, it's quite a strange uh, thing to look at them inside this very futuristic environment when they themselves are gone back going back 170 years inside these VR headsets um, I'm not sure if um, I shouldn't ask if anybody has a few questions now because um, I think that's pretty much the basics of the project. It's, it was a, always going to be a touring exhibition. It opened at Somerset House in London. It's now in Birmingham Warthog Gallery. In September, it will go to Laycock Abbey, which is Fox Talbot's family home and where he made probably all of these photographs originally. And it will then go to Bodleian Library in Oxford, we hope, and then Bradford, and then we hope to travel it abroad. Uh, 
I mean, we started to talk about it as the, he was seen to be holding up objects. Oh, yes. You know, and, and actually moving around mm. the artifacts in the room. Mm. And I just wondered how you were doing that. Or okay, so um, it's only the photographs that you can pick up in right. the exhibition as we have it at the moment. So also you might have seen on the front of the, I'm using HD Vive headsets, they seem to be the, certainly the best headsets in quality and also the best headsets if you want to have an experience where you can walk around as opposed to being tethered to a computer. On the front of my headsets I've got a device called the Leap Motion Attachment which just plugs into the top of your Vive headset and this allows you to basically sense where your hands are. So as soon as your hands in front of your head, sending out infrared signals, it can pick up your hands, and then it invents uh, like um, uh, a digital version of your hands in front of you. You can then um, create certain commands with inside your um, CGI environment where if you put your hand over the top of one of Talbot's photographs, you can then lift it out of the vitrine and you can scale it up so it's quite huge and you can appear to be holding it and have a better look of it in your hand. So there's a slight interactive element that's going on with all the prints inside um, the vitrines. It reminds me that I didn't say um, anything about the avatars. So uh, at each time we have up to six people inside the room moving around at any time to prevent collisions which is obviously a bit of a concern because people have got headsets on so they're essentially blind we created these digital avatars so our we have a, a server which is to keeping track of everybody that's in the room and then that, that's updating everybody's headsets to tell you where everybody else is it then creates this ghostly aura to indicate the other people in the room and where they are at the moment, to stop them bumping into each other. But it also fits in with the theme of kind of time travel and going back and haunting the past. Good question about the audio. Uh, yes. Was there any, did you feel any pressure or any, uh, to put a kind of, a, given the historical nature of it, to give a kind of a pedagogical or kind of a, you know, a context, to like a sort of a detailed, to what the people were sort of stepping into at that time. You mean to uh, brief people yeah, before you went in? Uh, well, how, how did the audio work? I mean, because uh, you, you can imagine this as a kind of an, almost like a museum exhibit where people do some like a, yeah. a, a, a voice telling you yeah. what, what you're looking at. Okay, yeah. yeah. Obviously, I know you, you, you didn't do that, but what, what, what audio, or what did you want the audio to do? Okay, so when people kind of came into the in Somerset House in London, the the antechamber, we had a lot of panels on the wall which gave you information about Talbot, information about the exhibition, the charters and all this kind of thing. Also, when you came, generally people knew a little bit about what they were going to see anyway. Um, and then the invigilators who were leading people into the room, sometimes, depending on their mood, gave you a little bit of background about what it is that people are going to experience. Other than that, you were going in blind and the audio inside the experience that created is just about uh, making you more immersed inside that wor world. So we have the ticking clock, which is above the entrance where you go in. Uh, we have the fire crackling, which gets louder as you move towards it, quite effective. And the chartist demonstrators outside the window. So the only means of actually alerting people to the fact that there are chartists outside on the street demonstrating is that they start to hear voices and breaking glass. It's on here, but I asked him to turn it off. That, that gets louder and louder until, ideally, your curiosity gets the better of you and you go over towards where the sound is coming from, which is outside the window. Because it's a six-minute experience, and it's not until after about three and a half minutes that the chartists come on the scene. Before that, if you look outside the window, you've just got nighttime fog and a couple of policemen walking up and down. Can I ask what you learned about the user experience doing this? Because it, I, mean, I did it in front of London, it was an extremely distinctive experience. And so there are aspects of it that for me were kind of mesmerizing and, and revelatory. There were also aspects of it I found very, very uncomfortable, I'd say. Because uh, it was a very humid day when I was there, yeah. and wearing the mask was kind of a, a, a strange right. experience. But what, how have you been able to think or analyze people's responses to it? Yeah, and I. Uh, 
It was a bit of a mistake, really, to open at Somerset House in London in a sweltering May-June period. Uh, we should have opened, I don't know, somewhere cold and with about three people and a dog coming through every day, <laughs> and then built it up to come into the, you know, obviously the busiest city in Europe. So it was a very steep learning curve, and the heat certainly didn't help. Birmingham Water Hall is totally air-conditioned, so it's kind of this temperature, and it's going so much smoother because computers don't like heat, and they particularly don't like heat when they're being used over and over and over, and we have people coming in every six minutes, so it's a computer just going onto somebody's back and then somebody else and somebody else, and it's constantly in use with no air-conditioning, no real ventilation going on. So that was a big problem, and then computers started going down. We had a lot of problems with leads, because you've got leads coming from the, the backpack PC, going to your headset, and you're getting them on and off people all the time, so little kind of leads start coming out. Once that lead comes out, even a couple of millimetres, the computer goes down, so you have to restart the PC. To do that, you have to uh, <coughs> plug it into our main monitor with a keyboard and a mouse, that takes a lot of time and then suddenly you start getting a backlog of people because we've got a queue that's got a time timing to it but when you've got to restart the computers it's going to take three or four minutes each time people start to get a bit annoyed in the queue there stress levels go up uh, so there, there are a lot of different things the um, the the foam head um, head mounts on the on the, on the headsets get very sweaty so we had some wipes for that which weren't the right wipes really we were using just like kind of wet wipes where it turns out actually the optical wipes that they were using for the lenses works better on the actual foam mount as well as the actual uh, eye mounts um, there, are, there are a lot of other things and this is more like Paul studying this because this is really his territory for me it's just a way of refining our project and, and improving it which, which we are doing there's another system uh, initially we had a system where as you walk into the room over the threshold as soon as the sensor detects you the game begins the six minutes begins this turned out to be a little bit glitchy and we now have a different version where we have a mouse glued onto the back of our PC and as soon as we get the person to the point of entering the room we click the mouse and then the game kicks in plays it six minutes so there's a lot of different uh, little kind of refinements going on batteries was another big thing uh, just having enough batteries so that we can keep charging because th these PCs that have got a hot swappable so there's two batteries on each one you take one battery off put a new one on you can take the other one so you, the computer can remain in the game and remain on while you swap in the batteries but you get through the batteries pretty quick and nowhere in the world had any of these batteries when we launched so we only had the number of batteries that we had backpacks so we basically had to buy about 18 backpacks which means that we're buying basically two batteries for two and a half grand rather than a hundred quid, which is what it should be for two batteries. Madness. But companies that I spoke to like six months before I said it was not a problem getting hold of batteries, take a week to get them. Suddenly when we came to order them, it was like four months before we could get you any. Lots of little problems like that. And you kind of learning as you as you go along really but it wasn't ideal to open in Somerset House with more or less constant fog fog going through it. Do you have any ideas to progress us or change it in terms of the next the next stage? Um I mean that that's quite significant yeah. just in improving this uh yeah and just being able to ha handle the public better as they're coming through and get that um interaction with the, the the kit and the and the people seeing the experience more think, more refined. I was thinking maybe more is, is there gonna be any other events in photography and history that you may use this? Right. because um, because it's going on tour and stuff and because it's basically almost uh, killed me making this project <laughs> financially and just the amount of work and stress involved. I'm not at the point of thinking of taking it on at the moment. Because it's also hopefully we've got like uh, a venue in Istanbul and um, where else? Quite a few different 
venue. So it's like kind of a constant. And each time it it goes on, I lose lots of money. It's like Blue New Order's Blue Monday single, because you know, it's really quite costly. There's a four pound fifty like entrance fee on here, but that if we look, it covers invigilation costs, and then you've got transport and installation and technical support and insurance, cleaning, blah blah blah. So it's it's problematic in terms of actually even trying to break even on it. But I would be interested in doing another VR thing. Maybe not photography. I was thinking about making, recreating the exhibition of degenerates that the, the Nazis put on in the 1930s, which is probably one of the most spectacular exhibitions ever staged. Although it was supposed to be a, you know, an exhibition demonstrating the worst type of art, they had some incredibly good painting sculptures in there. Great. Thank you very much. I, we um, just to keep rolling with the time and let me move on. Um, uh, hopefully Matt can stay around for a bit longer, I know there's a few issues with his studio at the moment, but we've got a couple more talks coming up, but um, hopefully he's here for coffee in the next hour or so, he might be able to ask more questions then. But if you can please give a Thank you very much.